OK, uh, now that we've looked at friction, I want to look at another case study of a formula that we would find in a physics textbook and how we can unpack and understand that formula and apply it in a uh, piece of code, in a processing simulation, you know, with circles moving around the screen. Because that's what we do with our lives. We sit around and we move circles around the screen. OK, so what I want to look at is a drag force. Now, drag force, also known as a viscous force, fluid resistance, air resistance, we're talking about a force when a body comes into contact with a liquid or gas. It experiences a force, again, in the opposite direction. Something falling experiences an air resistance, a force uh, pushing it back up. So let's take a look at the first. So it's very similar to friction conceptually, but it actually is, uh, operates in a, in a different way, which is kind of interesting to look at. So let's take a look at um, the formula. OK, so first of all, I have to remember this formula, and I might fail. But I'm going to give this a try. OK, the force of drag, I have a way of looking it up. <laughs> equals, plus I could always just start this video over, negative one half times rho times v squared, which I really mean the magnitude of velocity, the velocity squared, the speed squared, maybe I'll put, I'll do this, times uh, a times the coefficient of drag times velocity unit vector. OK, look at this formula. Ugh. <laughs> this one really looks awful, right? Like, how are we going to figure out all these pieces? But you know, it's actually, first of all, the formula itself is really simple. It's this times this times this times this times this times this. <laughs> so if we just know what each one of those things are, we just multiply them all together. You know, it looks a little fancy because it's kind of like got some Greek letters in it, and we don't know what all these things are. Well, it has one rho, but, and I didn't even write that very well. <laughs> but um, the point is, these formulas actually aren't that difficult to understand, even if they look a little bit um, kind of unapproachable. But the thing about this formula that we have to ask ourselves is, what do we really need here? So. What are all of the elements of this formula? OK, well, negative 1 half, that's clearly a constant. Rho, rho stands for density. So density you can think of as uh, you know, how dense the material is that you're moving through, air versus water versus mud versus something else. V squared, so V is the velocity, the magnitude of the velocity squared. The magnitude of the velocity squared, magnitude of velocity you can think of as speed. How fast is something going? I'm recording. <laughs> so that's kind of interesting, right? We can see just by this uh, formula here that the faster something is moving, the more air resistance, it, the more, sorry, drag it will experience. That is a very important fact, right? In fact, it's such an important fact that something <laughs> have uh, this is a different Clementine, it's not the same one, that this Clementine, right, if it's not moving right now, if I could hold it perfectly still, no drag resistance on it whatsoever. Only if it's moving is it experiencing that force. And the faster it's moving, <laughs> the, the, the stronger that force. This is very important. And this is kind of like, th the thing about all of this is, and I, I need to say this at the appropriate time, but I'm just going to say it now. The point of looking at this stuff is not because, aha, you want to make interesting things in processing and programming and graphics? F dr fluid resistance is the answer to everything you ever imagined. I mean, that's not at all the case here. This is just saying, like, look, if we can understand how to do this, number one, A, we can invent our own forces, and B, we might be able to find other forces and be able to understand how to unpack those formulas and use them. So it's really not about using this particular force, but you know, in, in these videos, I've got to have something to start with. So this is really why I like to say sort of like a case study in looking at something. But what's really, I think, useful about this in particular is realizing, ah, I could have something that's tied to an object's pro like the properties of that object, a force that's tied to how fast it moves, how big it is, what color it is. There's so many things that you could kind of choose to do in a creative way. So but here, the speed squared. A, so this is speed squared. A is a surface area, right? There's a big difference in the air resistance this will experience versus this will experience, this really aerodynamic uh, dry erase marker versus the kind of surface area on the bottom of this clementine is much larger than the pointy end of this uh, marker. It's terrible, you know. I don't know, what physics, people who teach physics must have all these like props and things to demonstrate with. But I just like clementines. OK, um, so you can see how surface area is important. And then, aha, coefficient of drag. 
This is the coefficient of drag. Well, again, this is just like the coefficient of friction. What are the two things that are coming in contact with each other? What are, what's, what's the liquid or gas? What's the object? There's a coefficient there that will describe the strength of that force. And then, you know, velocity unit vector. Because, aha, there's a negative here, and there's a velocity unit vector. We're going in the opposite direction of our velocity. So uh, um, I think I have a cold, by the way. D can you tell? <laughs> I don't know. It's coming on. Um, OK, so looking at all this stuff, let's ask ourselves a question. What is the density? I have an idea. <laughs> the density is 1. What is the surface area? Ah, I have an idea. The surface area is 1. Like, we might someday have a simulation where we really want to model that, where we have strangely shaped polygons and the actual, and as they're moving through this like liquidy thing, and the surface area actually makes a difference in how they move. But right now, if you recall, we have our circle, <laughs> our gray circle moving around. Yeah, the surface area is going to be the same for all the circles, whatever. Uh, let's not worry about it. Let's make our, let's make, we just want it to look kind of like air resistance. So let's just make our life easier, right? Let's set that equal to 1. But really, you know, that's a constant, that's a constant. Negative 1 half is a constant. Coefficient of drag is a constant. All of these things are constants. We could really simplify this formula to say we have negative some constant times the, um, sorry, the velocity squared times the velocity unit vector. Right? We could simplify the formula and say all of these things are constants. We just need, we just need to know is the, is the fluid, is the drag force strong or weak? Is it like water, jelly, light, refreshing air? I don't know. What is it? Is it strong or weak? How fast is it going? And what's the direction? So this is really good. And we can, we can, start, to, um, we can start to write our code now. We can start to say, what is the, again, we need to know direction and magnitude. Same thing as friction, direction and magnitude. Well, to, the truth of the matter is, I wish I hadn't erased what we had there before, because direction is exactly the same thing. We want to, I'm going to call this drag, we want to get velocity. We want to normalize velocity. And then we want to multiply it by negative 1. That's getting the direction. We've taken care of the direction of the force. Again, remember what we're doing here. Whenever we want to calculate a force, we need to know what way is the force pointing and how strong is it. First, let's get the direction. Let's get a unit vector pointing in the right direction. Then let's calculate the magnitude and let's scale that vector. Now we need to calculate the magnitude. What is the magnitude? Well, we did earlier up here, we got a copy of the velocity vector. So we probably could have, might it make sense to insert a line of code up there where we say speed equals that uh, velocity's magnitude, right? Actually, we don't need to put it up there because we can just do it down here. Speed equals that velocity's magnitude, and then some constant c equals, you know, some value, 0 0.01. And now drag, we just need to multiply it by that constant times the speed times the speed. Right? We've got, the form, we've got the formula. The formula boils down to a constant times the speed squared times uh, the, 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 the constant times the speed squared times the velocity unit vector in the opposite direction. We already got the vector in the opposite direction. Now we have the magnitude is a constant times the speed times the speed, speed squared. Great, we did it. It's really as simple as doing this. And this, I, I, I hopefully, will give us some um, interesting results that we can look at. So let's try to apply this now in our code. We're basically going to rewrite exactly what we mapped out here into our code. OK, we're back. And we're looking at this. And we're kind of going to do the same thing. I'm going to rename it drag. <laughs> and I am also need to get the speed. It's the only thing we don't have from before. Am I over here? Yeah. Um, the speed is the, vol uh, the mover's velocity magnitude. And then, and actually, you know what's kind of amazing about things? <laughs> Sometimes, <laughs> I, I don't know, this is not amazing. But it just occurred to me, right? I could say speed equals speed times 2 right now. Uh, not times 2. Oh, this video, I really should restart it. <laughs> speed equals speed times speed. I, should, I could say speed times speed. But, and that's what I should do. <laughs> I don't know why. But there is, by the way, a function in processing. Oh. 
Uh, maybe it's just not. Uh, maybe it's just not turning blue because it's not in the. Yeah, it's fine. Um, so there is a function called mag sq, which actually gives you the magnitude squared. So we could actually ask the um, the velocity vector to give us its speed squared just from it. But I, I, I'm sorry, I went off on a tangent there. And somebody will download this video and edit this part out and then send it to me. Um, but um, and then we're back right here, and we're looking at the magnitude. And now we're going to say, hey, let's multiply, let's scale it according to. The, the coefficient of drag times speed squared. And then let's apply that force to the object. And now, look, okay, so we have this thing falling, bouncing up and down. And as soon as I click the mouse, we're going to see a drag force. And you can see that it actually, it kind of, now it was a little bit overwhelmingly strong. So let's just sort of tune it down a little bit, tone it down a little bit, and let's try it again. But you can see. You can see it kind of, it's still pretty strong, but you can see it's really working. And what's interesting about it is uh, it almost reaches this, what you might look like a terminal velocity. And this is what happens. There's a point where the air is, when something is falling, where the air resistance and the force of gravity become essentially equal. And so there's, they, the net result of those two forces is zero, and the object falls at a constant velocity. right? Because the faster and faster it's going, air resistance gets gets larger and larger and larger because the speed is part of that air resistance magnitude. So let me just, so you can see, one thing that I should point out about these examples is I'm just kind of like, eh, writing some code, getting velocities, making some forces, blah, 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 here in the main program. Where are we? We're in draw, right? We have a mover. We make a new mover. We say update, edges display for this mover. And you know, somewhere in here, I'm calculating this drag force. But really, there's a slightly better object-oriented programming way that we could do this. And I just want to look at that. Here is an example that I'm going to show you. This is example 2.5 in the book. And what's, one thing about this that I think is useful to look at is that, first of all, the objects, so they don't experience air resistance here. They're only experiencing a fluid resistance when they land, in, when, they, when they're in this sort of darker area at the bottom. So you can see that they're falling at this speed, and then they slow down when they hit there. And what's interesting about this is the smaller ones right, go much more slowly than the larger ones. Why is that? Remember, acceleration equals force divided by mass. So they may all experience the same drag force, but their acceleration is going to be scaled according to how big they are. The bigger ones are able to like plow right through that liquid, whereas the smaller ones um, aren't able to do that as easily. But what I, what I wanted to look at this, though, is just to say, look, you can't really see this, but there is up here now a liquid class. So in addition to a mover, I've made a liquid class. And the liquid class describes this kind of rectangular area here. And if we look at it, we can see the liquid has an x, y, a width, and height, and a coefficient of drag. So it's defining an area and a coefficient, how strong is it. And what's interesting about this is you can see we have some functions. If the liquid contains the mover, then the liquid should drag that mover. So we have, we've taken that formula that we learned, and we put it into a function essentially inside the liquid class. This is a function which says, let me receive a mover, let me calculate that drag force through all the methodology we just did, and then return it back. So this is actually quite a useful thing when you want objects to exert forces on each other. You need one object to receive as an argument another object, and then compute that force, and then apply it or return it or whatever the sort of structure you're doing is. So perhaps sometime <laughs> this merits kind of its own video or discussion about how objects might talk to each other in a way. And that's really what we're doing here. Um, I don't know. Maybe I'll hear from some people to hear whether this is unclear and we need some to sort of elaborate on this. But um, that's what I wanted to point out about this particular video. So w one thing you might do now is take a look at this and see, could you create a more elaborate scenario? Could you create a larger sort of space on the screen with all sorts of different pockets of, of resistance, some weak, some strong. And what if you made something that actually sort of weirdly causes the object to speed up as it goes through it, this sort of like inverse uh, drag force? I mean, that may not really exist in the world, but you could sort of think of some type of interactive system that you could make where you're trying to avoid the parts that slow you down and get into the parts that speed you up. So these are some ideas or some things you might want to play around with in looking through uh, uh, um, these formulas, these examples, or something. <laughs>
Okay. Uh, thank you for listening. I'm very grateful. I really am. Uh, but no one's, probably, you, no one's probably at this point anymore, so no one just heard me say that. But that's fine. You don't need to hear any of this. Okay, goodbye. I'll see you again in momentarily, perhaps in the next video. Or never. I don't, I don't know if I'm really seeing you. I'm going to press the button now.